I should have actually said when I was asking about sweets, does anybody in here, have, apart from Willie, not have sweets? Because <laughs> Willie is the local distributor for, I'm not sure what they are. They're, opal, they're a cheaper version of Opal Fruits, but we're, we're well supplied. So <laughs> thanks for that, Willie. <laughs> Yours all end up in the box? <laughs> There's a phrase that we use in, uh, in Ulster, uh, and it's, it goes like this, you haven't got a mission. And it really means that whatever you're trying to do is quite futile. There's probably little point. You're bound to meet with failure, and you have little chance of success. And it is, uh, it is normal practice now for every, um, every business or every source of provision to have a mission statement. And there was a saying, we do have a mission, and this is what our mission is is all about. This is our purpose and our aim. Now, Luke 10 is really about a mission. And we saw, as, as uh, Stuart reminded us in, in Luke chapter 9, that Jesus sent out the 12, His 12 disciples, and here He sends out the 72. Now, it's a one-off event, and it's for a limited period of time, because when we go over to verse 17, it tells us that they came back, and they told what their experience was. Now, there are those people who over the years have been called by God through this very passage to go out in what we call full-time missionary service, and they've served God in any number of places in the world for many different years. But I was glad that Stuart in his prayer talked about those who serve God in this particular way, in a full-time capacity, uh, and that means usually somebody who is supported financially and prayerfully by others. But he also talked about those of us who are called. And I want to suggest to you that embedded in these verses are principles for the church and that explain our mission and tell us how it works. It gives us a pattern, if you like. This is not just for these few years of the first century A.D., but it's something that is to be ongoing right until the end of time. And so, I want just to really suggest uh, that we focus on three particular things in, in these verses. And the first one is simply to say that in here we, we read that God sends. This is the first, I think, and the most important aspect of God's mission to the world. Look at verse 1. This the Lord, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two. And then in verse 3, He says this, go, I am sending you out. So, the initiative is God's. It starts in Him, in the heart and the mind of our Creator God. And the reason is, of course, because of His love for the lost world that we are part of, and that's why He sent His Son to be part of our history. He came, of course, to reach out in rescue to people just like us. And now He's sending the 72, He's sending them in His own name, and so God, through them, is seeking and calling and reaching people out and drawing them to Him. But the important thing for our purposes is that this is heaven's mission, because God sends. Now, He gives us a picture of that mission. He calls it the harvest. And that's something that's very familiar to us, even though we don't live in a, an agricultural and rural setting. We know about the harvest. And it's interesting that in verse 2, he calls himself the Lord of the harvest. And that really, uh, I suppose, highlights to us that it's his harvest. He is in charge. He oversees it. It's his work, and the results are up to him. And then notice what he says in verse 9. He says twice, verse 9 and verse uh, 11, he calls the work the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God is comprised essentially of those people who belong to the king, 
who have given their hearts to Jesus Christ and who are members of that kingdom by faith. And the kingdom of God exists here and right around the world in the midst of all other earthly kingdoms and political structures. The kingdom of God is present, and it's God's kingdom. He builds it, and He extends it. And that's a great encouragement to us, isn't it? That God's way to do His work according to His will and His plan is to send people in His name. But the mission begins with God, and His strategy to accomplish and pursue that mission is to send people like us. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. When He was praying for His disciples just before He went to the cross, He says, I do not pray, Father, that you take them out of the world. We're not called to withdraw and hide away. He says, but I pray that you protect them from the evil one in the world. So, this is a great source of exhortation to us. And the word sometimes is used today, the word synergy. And synergy means the combination of two. It can be uh, uh, two people, it can be two organizations or more. And the idea is that they are together pursuing one aim. And the Bible is teaching us here that the mission of God is a synergy between God Himself and people like us. So, there is a divine and a human element. Now, that gives us great confidence, doesn't it? Because it's not about our ability, first and foremost, or our gifts or our wisdom. It is in the fact that God sends us. It's His idea. It's His plan. It's His way and has been down through the centuries. So, that's something that we need to hold on to in all that we seek to do for God and say, He is the one who sends. We go at His bidding, and it's His harvest. It's His kingdom. And then the second thing here is it tells us that there are people who go. Now, I notice what it tells us in verse 1. He appointed 72 others. Now, we don't know who they are. We don't know anything about their names. They're just what we might call ordinary followers of Christ. They're disciples, and they're in the kingdom. And Jesus appoints them, and in verse 3, He says, Go, I am sending you. Now, these verses describe for us, as I mentioned earlier, a particular what we might call campaign. But there's a kingdom principle here, isn't it? And it's the fact that God enlists believers and makes us messengers, agents of His mission. And notice it He calls us workers. Workers are few. So, every single one of us are part of this. If you are in the kingdom, if you can say, yes, I belong to the king, my allegiance and loyalty is to Him. That's what matters most to me. It's not this kingdom of which I am a part in an earthly sense. It's not my political aspirations or opinions, but it's the kingdom of God. That's what is of the priority for me. Then you are enlisted by God. Now, these people had to travel to different towns, it says, but you and I don't have to do that because we are already there. And it was lovely to hear Stuart in his prayer talking about where God has placed us, at the desk, in the lecture theater, in the office, the factory floor, the street where you live, the club where you relax, the family that you're part of, and the front line. We've been thinking about that on Sunday evenings. So, you don't have to necessarily go to another town. You don't have to make a geographical change because you are in lots of different places. And God has put you there. He's sent you there in the ordinary course of life. Look at verses 9 and 11. He talks about the kingdom of God. He says, the kingdom of God is near you. That's what you're to say. And he says that twice. 
when the people of God, you see, are alongside somebody else, then the kingdom of God is near. So, the fact that you are wherever God has put you means that there is a kingdom presence in your office or your family or street or factory, wherever it is. There is a kingdom presence because somebody from the kingdom of God is there in that place. And if you want to know what it looks like to live out the kingdom life, well, you go to, among others, to the Sermon on the Mount. And that describes kingdom living in this world. Do you ever say to somebody or about somebody, I knew you were here because I smelt you? Now, let me explain that. Maybe it's somebody who wears a certain kind of perfume or a particular aftershave. And maybe you walk into the house and you know that that person's in the house, you say, I knew you were here because I smelt your perfume or I smelt your aftershave. Hopefully, it's nice smells because there's an aroma, there's a fragrance. You say, I knew you were somewhere around. Well, you see, there's to be from us an aroma of the kingdom to those with whom we work or study or relax or live. Now, notice the task that Jesus gave to these people. And again, this is hugely encouraging for us. Notice what it says in verse 1. The Lord appointed 72 others, sent them two by two, great to have Christian company, ahead of Him to every town and place where He was about to go. So, their work, you see, was a work really of preparation, wasn't it? It was to make those towns and villages ready for the visit of Jesus Christ. And as we live out our kingdom lives, wherever God has put us, we can relax as we do that because we don't have to convert other people. Their salvation doesn't depend on our powers of persuasion or our theological understanding or expertise, or our evangelistic gifts, although if we have any of those, that's great. But often, God is simply sending us to prepare the way, to demonstrate what the kingdom looks like and what it's all about. Well, what does He call us to do? Well, look at verse 9. Heal the sick who are there. Now, we may not have some of the supernatural gifts that we would love to have, but we can do good to others. We can treat them with grace and kindness. We can show Jesus Christ to them and bless them. We can do it when we refuse to join in the gossip or the critical conversation that is taking place. And it tells us that the kingdom is near when you are there. And as you have an opportunity, you can identify with the King. You see, we're not called to be secret disciples. We don't have to preach to other people. We can simply, he says here, not only are we to do good, but tell them the kingdom of God is near you. So, when God gives us that opportunity, we can talk about the kingdom that we belong to and the difference that it makes in our lives. And the good thing is that God will take it from there. Jesus came after these people. They prepared the way, and God can use our lives and our witness and our testimony to prepare the way. The heart's work within somebody else is God's business. Only He can save and give new life and we simply need to live out our lives for God and pray that He will do what only He can do. And we rest in His purpose and His sovereignty. Now, it's interesting. And again, Stuart mentioned this in prayer, that we go as lambs amongst wolves. Now, that's not very encouraging, isn't it? That sounds pretty much like you're beat before you start. Great opposition. Well, I think what he's saying is it's, it's the David and Goliath picture. 
Because the truth is, on the world stage, God's people are quite insignificant. We don't have power, as the world understands it. We're not people of great influence, but that's the way it's always been. The church has always been, in human terms, weak and feeble. Jesus talked about the mustard seed, and the mustard seed is a little tiny seed. If it was sitting on my hand, you probably wouldn't even see it. And yet, He said, it can grow into a great plant that birds can nest in. And you see, the gospel is the power of God, isn't it? We are only the ambassadors. We are just the messengers. We are the channels through whom God can, can talk about His kingdom and about the King Himself. But remember what God did all those centuries ago. He took a bunch of nobodies who were transformed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ and who were energized and empowered and given courage by the Holy Spirit, and He sent them out. And the world has been transformed by those individuals in the hand of God. But we are few in number. That's what it says in verse 2, doesn't it? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And you will know wherever God has placed you that you are probably in a small minority. You're part of a very restricted group of people. It's becoming increasingly that, like that. But remember, you might be only one person, but a little light can have a great effect in the darkness. A little bit of salt can do a great work of seasoning. It's not essentially about numbers. One person, you see, who loves the king and who lives out the kingdom life can make a great impact as they love people. It can make a real impression on those around and get them to begin to think about what it is that makes you tick. Why is it that you live the way you do and do the things you do? Why do you have the priorities that you have and the goals? And God will do His work as pleases Him. Another interesting thing, it says there that they are not to take a purse with them, not to greet anybody. Now, that sounds strange. All of us have got to live. Some people have taken that literally. They've gone out and said, I'm not going to work for money. Somebody else supports me, and that's fine. We're to, we're to provide for ourselves. We're to be courteous. But I think what this means is that the kingdom is to be our focus. Apparently, greetings in the Middle East in those days could take forever. You didn't just say hello to somebody, shake your hand. You talked about all sorts of things, and you could idle away time. And, and I think what, what uh, Jesus is saying is don't be distracted by the trivial. Don't be absorbed by the material. But let's make the kingdom that which is priority for us. So, there are many activities that you and I are engaged in in life, and as we are part of those activities, let's be kingdom people. Let that be our priority. So, let me ask you then, are you, are you serving the king wherever he's placed you? As you do your ordinary stuff, you're serving him by serving others. And is your prayer and the pattern of the Lord's prayer, your kingdom come? So, God sends, people go, and lastly, very briefly, the world receives. The harvest is plentiful. That's important, isn't it? God sends out people, and some of them are ready for reaping. There are people out there who are ripe for the gospel, and they need to hear that, people that you work with, people that you relax with. We live today in a secular society, and I know that for many people, God is just not on the radar. They live for today, live for themselves according to their own rules, but there are others who deep inside are searching. They're looking for meaning and purpose and satisfaction, but the problem is they're, they're looking in the wrong place. Do you ever remember the, the game that people of my age and maybe older used to play when we were children called Hide the Thimble? Some of you ever play that? Young people don't know what they're missing today, sure they don't. This was cutting-edge fun. 
You know what it is? Somebody took a small thimble and they put it somewhere in the room when you were out, and you came and you had to find it. And they said to you, you're cold. And if you moved a particular way, they said, you're getting colder. Or step the other way, you're a little bit warmer. And then, of course, the idea was that you got warmer and warmer and really hot when you were near wherever the thimble was. Well, there are people today, and we'd say to them, look, you're really cold because you're looking in the wrong place. They want fulfillment, and they want to pursue and find significance. But they're looking in the wrong place. Evolution, you see, tells people today that their lives mean nothing. They're just part of a long process that has been going on for millions of years and will continue. Their lives are no more important than that of a slug that crawls on the ground, but you and I know different. We can tell them about the fact that they are made in the image of God, that they're of infinite value, that the Creator calls them to come to Him. And if you're surrounded by people who do believe in a God of some kind, They probably have an instinct that if they have any hope, they've got to improve themselves, make themselves better. But you can tell them about God's grace, that He sent His Son to bring them forgiveness. You can tell them about the gospel that means we don't have to strive to impress God, but rather that He will pardon us and bring us into His kingdom when we give our hearts to the King. And he talks in these verses about peace, and we want people to have that, don't we? And the response, he says, will vary. And some people say, he said, they won't receive it. It'll, it'll come back to you. I think that means they're just saying, keep your peace. Some will be hostile. Verse 10, it says, some won't welcome you. And that's the reality, isn't it? There are those who you know They're in your world, and they don't want to know about the gospel. They've made up their mind. They've dismissed any of those things as irrelevant. But there are others, it says, who will welcome. There are hungry people out there. They're not being fed. They're thirsty. They're not finding that thirst quenched. And they're open to hear about the kingdom. And hopefully they've seen evidence of it in you. And they're ripe for the harvest. And friends, as I close, remember this. This is vitally important. In verse 12, it talks about that day, the day when God judges all things. And it says it will be more bearable for Sodom. Remember that city in the Old Testament recorded in Genesis, which was openly immoral, was full of rampant sexual sin. And God says it will be more bearable for them. The punishment for them will be less severe than for those who openly and outrightly reject the gospel. That's what Jesus is saying. Serious eternal consequences. These are life and death issues. There's a great urgency. These things really matter. So, friends, when you leave this place and where you go to wherever God has you tomorrow, if you're working or the rest of the week, wherever that might be, God sends you. That's His way. And you, if you're in His kingdom, you are the kingdom near wherever you go. People all around you, lost people, you have the treasure of the kingdom. If you live a kingdom life where God has sent you, maybe God can prepare the way, and the Lord of the harvest can use your efforts to gather the lost to Himself.